So let me just briefly introduce our panel to you. Uh, Tracy Childrick, you have met already. She has contributed very substantially to what's been said today and to the, the, the knowledge that's been uh, available to us this morning. Uh, Jackie Brock, who is closest to me here, uh, has a background mostly as an education civil servant, but has worked on many other aspects of public policy relating to the welfare of children. And just over a year ago, she became Chief Executive of Children in Scotland. And in the middle is Stephen Naismith, a self-confessed journalist who's uh, worked on the big issue in Scotland, but who now covers social policy for the Herald and edits the Herald's society page. He's also a member of the Glasgow Children's Panel and a trustee of the People's Postcode Lottery here in Glasgow. Would you please welcome our panel? <laughs> Tracy, we've uh, had made you say a lot today, but I know you've also been listening quite intently to what's been going on around you. What struck a chord with you today? Okay, thank you. I won't s speak for very long because I know you've probably heard uh, enough of my thoughts today, but uh, just a couple of things. I think we need to, to think carefully about what the particular issue is that we might be wanting to address. So we've talked uh, a lot this morning about troubled families, and I think I would, I would stress, as, as Rob and I said in, in the talk, that that actually um, the sorts of families that we might define as troubled families are, are very unusual. So we need, we, need to, we need to think carefully about what it is we're, we're, we're talking about. I think we have to talk about structures of opportunity. And if we, if we start to do that, then we have to think about um, the opportunities in terms of the labour market. So we, t we talked earlier about the importance of recognising that work extends far beyond what, what people might do in terms of paid work. But we know that paid work is, is, is really important. So we, we need to think about structures of opportunities. And um, we heard this morning that, yes, there, there aren't enough jobs out there and that's a really important point to, to, to be made but also we need to think about the quality of jobs. I think in kind of debunking some of the myths about intergenerational un unemployment or the causes of unemployment um, we lead ourselves into to really very difficult questions because what, what do we then do and if, if, if we're going to conclude that we need better jobs those are really big important policy questions that, that many of us feel that we can't do a great deal about so I think there's some um, very very important questions there. <coughs> Um, we've talked about intergenerational transmission of values and attitudes, and I think, I don't want to say a great deal about it, but I think there are some really significant questions there, because we know that poverty is, for want of a better phrase, and I don't like it, transmitted intergenerationally. We know that over, over time that families um, do experience poverty, and that is likely to play out across generations. So there's really important questions about how we explain that and how we might understand that. And just one final um, point, I'd like to publicise a, um, a short film that some of you might already know about. Some of us have been tweeting. Ruth Patrick, who's doing some fantastic work at Leeds University for her PhD, talking to people on welfare, and she's produced a short film which is really excellent, and we've reiterated the importance of listening to people's experiences, and maybe if we could send around a link to that, and people could, um, when they have the opportunity, use that and publicise it, um, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Jackie, the family is obviously central to much of what you do. What have you taken out of today so far? Thank you. Well, I was thoughtful about the title of this series, Understanding Poverty. And I think, as tends to happen in groups like this, meetings like this, there's an incredible depth of understanding and knowledge about poverty and its close links with inequalities that bedevil Scotland. Scotland actually is a very successful society in many ways. We've seen quite a dramatic decline in Scotland and the UK in crime and in youth offending. Um, and we've seen quite a dramatic decline in tobacco use, um, and particularly among young people. And in terms of education, attainment is going up. However, the exception to all of that is in our most deprived, 15 to 20% of deprived areas and families within Scotland, 
that inequality has stayed the same. Nothing has improved in terms of those measures that where life is changing for families and improving for children and young people, they are not improving using those measures and many others for children in our um, most deprived areas. So I think that knowledge that just when we heard this morning from Tracy and John around the, we need to understand more around the impact of poverty and the, the linking with inequalities. And also the comments that they made around the history, knowing our history. So for example, we, I think we're pretty good and knowledgeable around the history of Glasgow, Clydebank and the Ayrshires. Um, so we, we know an awful lot of that and we understand the links about why we have what we have in those areas and linked back to how that's changed since the 80s. But the key thing, and that was certainly a big theme for us at our table, why aren't we doing anything about it then? Why aren't we doing what, what do we need to do to take action to combat it? So if I could just throw out a few thoughts um, around what we do. Um, but I'm, I'm sure that the, the key sort of manifesto for action, if you like, is going to come from you. But just to throw out some thoughts, I would challenge some a statement made by, in a couple of the presentations earlier around uh, young people, particularly around the age of 13 or in transition to secondary school, have been failed by education. That's just too easy and simplistic. Young people, when they're transitioned to secondary, are actually going through this explosion in their hormones. It's very similar to the explosion going around when they're toddlers. We have to, they, they crave at that age being with their peers. They need to separate from their families. They, they challenge institutions. So why aren't our schools responding, but why aren't we as a society understanding that they, need, they and their peers need a community within which they can be young people, within which there are things to do, within which they are valued and given hope and aspiration. And taking that forward into local areas, I think there's a huge frustration, particularly in our most impoverished communities, that there is an awful lot of investment of money and people. But how effective are they? If we're to be very hard-nosed about this, they are totally ineffective because we have seen no significant improvement in inequalities in those areas. So what do we need to do about it? What investment decisions need to change? What reprioritizing of, of resources needs to happen? And I would again say, that again, the solutions have been raised here already. We need to be thinking far more at a community, local level about what's needed. And finally, um, nationally, I think um, we need to be... Um, we need to be very, very mindful of some of the investment decisions we're making. Um, a bit of a cheap shot would be, why are we preserving higher education at the risk of community-based college places, but crucially skills development for children and young people? But, but, but others will have other views on that. But we make decisions to prioritize various sectors without, I think, an understanding of what the vast majority of young people need. But the final point is that if we're to think about the evidence, and if the evidence is crucially that we have to look at jobs, I would like to know, because uh, does a plan, an economic plan, for, let's say, Glasgow, Clydebank, the Ashes, is it, does it exist? Where are the jobs going to be? And if there is a plan, have the folk who have that vision and plan told the schools and the colleges and other supporting schools and colleges, so we can begin to work with families, parents, schools, etc., to provide the skills for what those future jobs are going to be. Because otherwise, surely so much investment in these communities, um, what, what really, what, what are we doing if we don't have a jobs plan in mind? Thank you. <clears throat> And finally, Stephen, a recurrent theme today has been the disconnect between evidence and perceptions and through perceptions with policy. Um, I fear that your profession and mine cannot escape some of the responsibility for this. As a journalist writing in the field, what's your take on all of that? Uh, well, first of all, I'd just like to say that I'm sorry I've only managed to come for this session and I'm sorry to have missed the, the earlier kind of discussions and it seems like it's been a very interesting day. Uh, I, I just wasn't able to get out for any more of it than this. But I think I can perhaps be hopefully useful here in that I, I, I've uh, spent some time involved with, with kind of looking at poverty in the media in the past and I've, I've discussed these issues before. 
uh, because I, 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 my perception is that people feel the media has a big role to play in, in addressing some of the kind of perceptions about, uh, about things like uh, intergenerational worklessness, worklessness, for instance. I find myself on panels like this, and uh, it's frustrating sometimes because I feel as if the Herald is not the worst offender here, but uh, I'm, I'm willing to kind of take the brickbats and be, be held to account and also to kind of offer some insights perhaps into what might be done to, to address media attitudes, which I think can be very hard to shift. And I think it's worth recognising as well that they come, uh, that the media is, is not isolated in this. There's a background of a very intensive and very effective uh, kind of propaganda from, from politicians and things, and, and things like that, which, which there's, a, there's a sort of interplay there, uh, which makes the task of, of tackling some of these, these myths very hard, hard to achieve. Um, I'm told that there has been some discussion during the day about the kind of power of anecdote, and I think that's, that is uh, a factor, and I, I suppose that may have been to do with things like the, the, the single uh, apparently outrageous anecdote that's used to justify a, a kind of a benefit cap and that, that kind of thing. But I think anecdote is powerful, and anecdote affects all of us, and so um, you, you have, I mean, as, as I, I read research like the, the, the study the JRF have, uh, have distributed here of, of Tracy's and others, that's a very important message, the, the fact that this idea of intergenerational, uh, three generations of, of, of joblessness and so on, is, is very hard to prove and actually statistically very, very rare. Uh, it's hard to get that message out there because it doesn't always chime with people's own experience and it doesn't necessarily chime with my own experience in that sitting on the children's panel, I've seen families where uh, there the seems to be a, a, a level of, you, you're trying to kind of seek the best way forward for a family, and there seems to be a complete disinterest in, in anyone in, in work. Uh, and I've had uh, interviews I've done with young people. Uh, I remember a very powerful kind of case study I did with a young person who was involved in the Prince's Trust Young Ambassador Programme, who said she was the only person in her, her kind of community on the outskirts of Edinburgh who, who was getting up and going out that she knew to work in the morning. She was kind of seen as a curiosity, not simply for having a job, but almost for wanting a job. And that's the kind of anecdote, I think, that, uh, that you have to counter. The reason I raise it is because it's the kind of anecdotes I will hear from my editors when I'm trying to explain a story and that kind of thing. And if you're trying to tackle those media perceptions, I think those, you need to think about those kind of approaches. You can approach a journalist like me who is sympathetic, and that's what I always urge people to do, is to find the kind of journalists who are writing in a field, who are writing the kind of things that, that chime with what you want them, the messages you want to get out. Uh, but you need to be aware as well that, that we operate in a context where we have to then go and sell stories to our news desk. The news desk may take a story that I've, uh, I've suggested, but then it may still fall foul of the, the editor who, who later comes along and tells the news editor he's not very interested it, in it and, and so on. And I do find myself having to counter uh, in editorial conferences and that kind of thing, people saying, well, this is, this is what's going on, you know, this is what we've seen in the Daily Mail, <laughs> this is what we've seen in the Daily Telegraph, what about that? And you can, I can say all I like, this, this, this is a myth or that the research doesn't prove this. The, there's always a tension there between that sense uh, from, from editors in the media that they need to, sorry, I keep doing that, <laughs> that they need to follow the, the kind of existing line or the existing story. What I would say is that there need to be other anecdotes, and the more that uh, we can provide alternative anecdotes, um, the better. I, I acknowledge that the kind of anecdotes I was relating just a minute ago are far from the whole story. They're far from the whole story because I can give you other anecdotes uh, in my own personal experience of people who do extraordinary unpaid voluntary work on behalf of their communities and have done it for decades and uh, may appear as, as someone who's who's never worked really in the statistics, but uh, make more of a contribution to their communities than, than the vast majority of people in the Herald newsroom, I, I, I might suggest. <laughs> uh, you, you know, so there, there, are, there are anecdotes on the other side. It's always useful to have those kind of things, and that's why the media are always pressing uh, people like the Poverty Alliance for case studies, which I know can be difficult to get, and I've certainly had struggles myself with that in the past with people who understandably are reluctant to talk about their own financial circumstances and that kind of thing in the media. Um, but there needs to be other anecdote. There also needs to be, I think, a kind of concerted effort to, to counter 
myths. So this very specific one about the intergenerational worklessness, there's a really powerful uh, potent study here saying that this, you, just, you look around and you just can't find these families. That's really interesting, and that's a story from, from the point of view of the media. But I feel there has to be a kind of almost a, a deliberate focus campaign on that specific issue to explain, that, so, so that you know, experts sort of say it every time, every time they come out, and are always looking for opportunities to spread that message. Because I feel that's what happens on the other side, you know, that's what happens with the government propaganda, that's what happens with the, the Daily Mail, is that day after day it's a kind of drip, drip effect of saying, we have these, these scroungers who are uh, a, a sort of drain on society, and I suppose what I'm saying is that these myths are very hard to challenge, and I think it needs to be really uh, a sort of sustained campaign to, to counter them in the media, and I'll go back to what I was saying about finding sympathetic journalists and trying to, you know, there are people out there who are trying to, trying to counter some of these myths. Um, I, I, I sort of essentially felt it would be useful just to come along here and, and answer questions, so I'm, I'm here essentially to do that. But uh, the, the other thing I would say is that, you know, the problem for media is complexity, and uh, so the anecdotes can be very powerful. I recognise that for the, ch the, the families who come in front of me at the children's panel, there are a lot of complex issues behind the apparent kind of surface, surface reading of their situation and behind perhaps their, their feeling of, of hopelessness in relation to, to, to work, for, for example. Um, those issues are, are tricky, tricky for the media to deal with, I suppose. Um, but uh, that, that's more or less it. I'm happy to <laughs> field questions. Once again, three thoughtful contributions, but it's over to you. It's entirely down to you to say what you think the room needs to be focused on, what the room needs to hear uh, around this agenda. Um, you can either pick up on the points that the panel have made just now, or you can throw us some of the things that came out in your roundtable discussion, or tell us reactions to, uh, now you've had a chance to reflect on what you heard this morning. So who would like to kick us off? Who would like to, what's been important to you today? What, uh, what, what, what struck a chord with people? now. Yeah, at the back there. For myself, the thing that came out this morning which was useful, I think, is to get away from the blame game and to talk about what the reality is and the low pay, no pay cycle being what the majority are experiencing and how that affects you as a person but also as a, as a small community planning and the fact that the growth of the zero hour contract seems to be exponential. So society seems to be set up to function business to make money rather than for business to function society. So the, the relationship's the wrong way round and the narrative is being driven by the Daily Mail which are a right wing propaganda that have recently done that and the media's social responsibility within that beyond selling newspapers you know once upon it was the truth but now it seems to be the truth how we want to tell you it because the media seems to have a fair shame of blame but they could be when you talk about a lot of issues they could be the catalyst for change because everybody for instance being at the poverty alliance wants to campaign on issues and where was the zeal of the campaigning small newspaper man that, 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 that lived on, in the small villages and told the st stories that people wanted to hear rather than the stories the other way around? Out of work is the short answer to the last question, I have to say. Uh, sure, I mean, how, how do people respond to the point that, 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 that Stephen, well, two points that Stephen was making. First is the, the, this idea that, that, that there's a need to combat uh, the drip, drip, drip of anecdotes, real or imagined, in like measure, in other words, to generate stories that run against those stories, rather than hitting the media with reams of statistics that are not going to excite them. That's the first point. But secondly, the point that Stephen made, made about the difficulty of getting these things across to the media. What's your experience been on that? How do people respond to that? I mean, is it simply down to the wickedness of journalists, or do you accept there are other issues? Yeah. I don't want to hog it again, but I was, uh, I was really uh, uh, interested in what Stephen had to say. That I completely agree that uh, being a qualitative researcher, so somebody who sort of talks to people rather than counts things up, mm. that stories are important. Uh, and the story that we might want to tell, for instance, about how this churning between low pay and no pay, is the more com it's a more complicated story, yeah? Mm. Than just saying they're all uh, skivers. 
the skivers one day, strivers the next, if you, if you know what I mean. Sure. So we need to do that. I think the Herald has actually been quite good on this. I was just trying to Google it now, and I think you covered our report quite nicely, uh, <laughs> actually. Uh, but, you know, so academics can uh, uh, work hard to provide you with these sorts of stories. What more can we do? Stephen. Um, well, I suppose partly what I'm saying is, is kind of repetition helps and finding same way, new ways to tell the same story is really what you see day in, day out in the, uh, in the, the more right-wing newspapers. It's not as if the story changes that much. It's just new, new examples, new, new spins on you know, the, the, the Skyvers versus Strivers agenda. Uh, so I don't think people should be ashamed to just recycle what's already been said. Uh, but you do have to find new ways because new, uh, news desks thrive on, on kind of fresh, refresh, refreshing the ideas. Uh, there's an agenda, obviously, in some of these, some of these papers, and the agenda is, is driven by uh, being naive to think it's not driven by ownership and by, by the, the editors of papers who have um, their own politics, which is, which is showing through. I'm perhaps a little cushioned from that at the Herald, where we, we really are genuinely pretty in independent thinking, I think. We don't have... Uh, proprietors telling us what to uh, what to um, what to write, uh, and so you know we have a leader in the paper about about poverty and mental health today. Uh, we, we cover we'll be covering the, the food bank story tomorrow. I, th I think there's an element of um, pushing on an open door in some quarters at the moment because just as there are uh, there are papers that are very determinedly pushing uh, a kind of coalition government agenda. On, on welfare reform and the like. There are other papers that are, and, and other media that are really very interested in the, the changes that are going on uh, the, uh, and, and sort of horrified by the growth in food banks and concerned about zero hours contracts and that kind of thing. The Herald certainly is, is, is kind of repeatedly interested to run stories about these topics. So I think that there's a, an opportunity there yeah. as well as a, a challenge. Can I just pick up on that before I go back to the, the, the floor? Because it occurs to me, that, I mean, there's another opportunity in there too, Steve. I wonder if you'd agree with it. It seems to me that for the reasons I was being slightly facetious about a moment ago, it's actually never been easier to get stories into the papers because resources to go out and report and find stories in newspapers are, uh, and in the media generally are the least they have ever been. People don't get out of newsrooms. They don't get the chance to go and build up contacts and so forth. The newspapers are dying to get stories ready-made and presented to them that they can run in the paper at zero resource output. So, I mean, in that sense, it's actually easier to get your stories accepted. There is more of an, an, an open mind, if you like, to what's coming in, simply because they don't have the resources to fill the space as easily as they used to. I wonder if you'd agree with that. I mean, so I'm, I'm slightly exaggerating for effect, but I think it is Slightly, easier. but there's, there's, there's certainly been. an issue there. I mean, the, yeah. the, the decline of the local newspaper man that was being... Uh, was being discussed. I mean, there's been a big decline in newspapers generally. We've yeah. had a lot of uh, people are who, who, who no longer buy newspapers but want to read the content and online risk losing newspapers, uh, which I obviously think is a very bad thing. But we, we've lost out in terms of circulation to the internet and a lot of our advertising has also gone to the internet. So there's been a huge contraction in jobs. And so what you're saying here is right. If yeah. you can find a reporter, if you can get hold of a reporter, because we're all much, much more stretched than we used to be, they are very receptive. But an email to the news desk is worth doing. It, it, yeah. and, or, or to an individual reporter, because, yes, yeah. people are looking for content. Yeah. Peter, you were trying to come in, I think, yeah? Yeah. Um, it was a question, I guess, partly to Jackie, but maybe actually to the, to the rest of the room as well. We've heard a lot about the lack of an evidence base for this notion of the, the cycles of poverty and the intergenerational mm -hmm. dimension or aspect of poverty. I guess my question to you is, you're, you're the chief exec of a large network of, of organizations. How much do you think within that large network, within, your, within the membership of that network, would those ideas resonate? Would, would people um, accept some of the findings? Because, I mean, one of the things that, that we find, um, I'm sure it's not the case in this room, but we've found that even when we talk about these ideas, people that, that we work with are resistant to them, partly for the reasons that Stephen mentioned, but these are, these are strong and very powerful anecdotes that, that people always know a family somewhere um, that, that's been in this situation. So, so my first part of my question is, um, you know, to what extent do the voluntary organizations that you're working with 
really get this? Do they, do they really accept it? And then I think the second part is maybe to you and to the rest of the room is, well, what do we do about it? If, if we do accept the arguments that were being presented here today, um, what do we do about it? And it's maybe picking up on uh, Sharon Wright's last couple of mm -hmm. points about what, what we need to do is partly challenge it ourselves, but how do we actually practically go about doing that? Big question, sorry. <laughs> Jackie, <laughs> begin. <Thank> you, Peter. <laughs> um, I think we've got over 400 members in Children's Scotland from local authorities, NHS, small and large, um, voluntary sector as well. And um, undoubtedly, there's a, sen there's, a, there's a sense of mission into, from the third sector anyway, and they are dealing with the causes of the, um, sorry, they're not dealing with the causes, they're dealing with the symptoms rather, sorry, in terms of day-to-day -day interaction with children, young people and families. Um, and my, my worry and the challenge to them and us is that we have to accept, I think, that we might well be making differences on a day-to-day -day level, and there will be undoubtedly some individual triumphant stories about how we have supported individuals, undoubtedly. Um, Stephen, I'm sure, knows all of them. We all have them, and that's great. And will that keep us satisfied? Or does the weight of evidence, is it sufficient? At what point will it be sufficient? The so-called tipping point for us realizing actually that sort of dealing very well with the symptoms in individual cases is simply not enough for the complexity that we've heard about from this morning that our, um, so many of our families and children, 200,000 children living in, in absolute poverty, um, too many are living in, in too many concentrated parts of, of Scotland. And that's really going to be very hard because we are going to have to be saying to some, in terms of some of our practices, actually the evidence suggests that some of the work is simply not effective if we're to have a sufficient, um, if, if we're to be looking at resources to move to effectiveness. So I was talking to a colleague here where they are very deliberately saying actually in, in some of the areas, some of our disadvantaged communities, a lot of the work which is focused on helping individuals, we're having to, to, to change investment decisions because that is just not sufficient. We have to look at other ways, community-based ways, ways that we know are evidence-based and will have a better impact. But it's going to be really, really painful, I think, because essentially there is a huge amount, there's a huge workforce committed to doing things that are around tackling symptoms. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there's going to be a lot of self-examination and challenge and a lot of pain, actually, as we hopefully move forward in terms of, of, of working more effectively. For Tracy, there's also the small matter of a thing called the electoral cycle, isn't there? I mean, there, <laughs> the, you know, I, I mean, I was struck by something John Washman said this morning. You know, These myths keep coming back because they're convenient rather than because they're genuinely believed in the face of evidence. Yeah, I mean, and I think I think we've we've talked about it that they're actually they're simple and people can relate to them and they you know at a, a simple level they make sense and in, once you start to unpick them actually you know we're, we're faced with much much more difficult challenges and and that's that's the difficulty so they they do appeal because they are simple. And mm -hmm. There were some more hands up. Can we see them again over there? Yep. I think it's also interesting the way that we, we sort of speak about the report and some of the stuff within it. When you follow sort of Twitter and people tweeting about this report, this sort of great celebration that we've proven the Daily Mail angle on culture of, cultures of poverty, poverty wrong. And that's great. But actually, I think the second, I think all the presentations this morning were fantastic. But I think the sort of bit after the coffee break was as important. Because we have to tell a story which actually chimes with people's sense that there is there are problems here, and if we don't acknowledge that there are problems here, we don't get anywhere in terms of winning their hearts and minds. The problems might not be those that they think there are, but they are still there, and I think that second half of this, of this morning really brought it together. And sort of, I suspect there are a few folk, as one of the questions this morning was sort of talking, sort of implying, well, what are we left doing then? Are we all wasting our time? And the second half of the presentation made clear that no, we weren't necessarily, not that we couldn't improve, but we certainly weren't wasting our time. And it's important that it's not just about celebrating the destruction of a pernicious ideology, that, but we have something to replace it. 
chance would be a fine thing, but we have something to replace it with um, in, 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 in terms of the sort of um, findings that we're putting forward as well. Thank you. Anybody else want to come in on this, please? Yes, front table here. Oh, it's just an answer to Peter's question, what more could we do? I think the talk we had this morning, um, that should be televised on Channel 5 and called um, The Generation Game, challenging it and proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've been struck by the faith people haven't had many folk watch Channel 5, but that's maybe just me. <laughs> Anybody else want to come in on this? Oh, sorry, yeah, at the front there. It's getting aerobic, this, isn't it? Well done. <laughs> uh, just a quick comment on the scale of the challenge. Um, the organisation that Jack um, Tracy sorry, referred to, Jackie, sorry, I'm getting mixed up, was um, Health Scotland, who I work for, and we've recently changed our strategic focus away from improving general population health to reducing health inequalities. And in mapping out how we're going to hopefully achieve that, we've been consulting the evidence as to what would be needed um, in terms of interventions. And it's quite clear from the evidence that a focus on downstream interventions and interventions requiring people in the most disadvantaged areas to opt in are least likely to be effective both for health behaviour change as well as reducing inequalities because those most resourced and with the most agency to listen to messages will do so at the expense of others. So we've got a big challenge and we are refocusing our efforts to try and look more upstream to the wider social, economic and physical environment, as well as the, what we call the fundamental causes around the distribution of wealth, power and money in our society. But we're under no illusions, it's going to be really, really difficult for many of the reasons that have been discussed around infiltrating the media to for them to change their communications and their sort of influence on public perception. And I guess, alluding to an earlier comment, I'd welcome suggestions from Stephen in particular as to how we can better engage with the media. My own experience is if you write a really well thought out press release and you give that to reporters, then there's a good chance they'll just use that direct because they are under so much pressure. Um, my other sort of example from my own experience is if you can sensationalise your story in some way. So we recently reported a 2.6% fall in consumption. I thought that was really exciting. <laughs> um, our head of comms was like, that isn't a story. And then she asked me to convert it into bottles of wine and it became four and a half million fewer bottles of wine. And that was a headline and the papers loved it. <laughs> so it's about better understanding that and trying to sort of connect with people's... Obviously, you don't sensationalise things for the Herald. I, mean, that <laughs> I, would, I would just pick up on what you... I would just pick up on what you are saying at the end there, because you changed how you described it. You described it as sensationalising the story. And then right at the end there, you said connecting with people. I, I, I would resist the, 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 the idea that the newspapers always are looking to sensationalise. Some, to some extent, it's, that's an understandable perception, and sometimes they are. But our business is communication, and what we're trying to do is, is reach people, and it's, that's why we need case studies of uh, people in, in, in situations where you can perhaps explore the complexity of their situation situation a bit more rather than just looking at the kind of, the, uh, that's why we need that, that's why we need the, the statistics to be presented in a, an accessible way. It's about what readers will read and it, there's no use us printing your 2.6% or I can't remember, 20%, 26%? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter, the, yeah. uh, the, the, the fact is readers won't engage with it, well as they would engage with the bottles of wine piece and they will get the same message and so I, I, I wouldn't call it always sensationalism. Uh, that's can I ask you a question just before we move on from this? How hard is it for an organisation like yours to, ha to make that sort of strategic change? Because I mean, I'm always struck by the way third sector bodies generally are full of people, full of passion and enthusiasm for what they do. But in some ways, that makes it harder, I think, it seems to me, to sit down and say, actually, do you know, I wonder if we've been doing this the right way. It might be better to be doing something else. Because people get locked into what they're doing. How hard was it to, to, to have that shift of approach? Um, it's very difficult. We're going through the transitional phase at the moment and because a lot of people have been doing a lot of things over the past number of years for the right reasons and have become very skilled in what they're doing, it's obviously very difficult and threatening for them mm. when an organisation says, well, we're going to stop doing much of that and we're going to shift to doing these other things which require skills which people don't necessarily have. So naturally, because we've had this change of direction, we're going to be engaging in more political 
conversations and that's a worry for many people who don't necessarily feel they've got the ability to engage in those conversations. Mm. I'm seeing so, nods along the panel and does anybody want to pick up on, on, on that? I think the, um, just go back to the evidence in, in um, so Mark's, Mark's world, there's such striking successes tobacco probably being the most high profile, given the dramatic decline in tobacco use, um, apart from a, a stubborn cohort of, of our poorest young people in particular, but, but all adults in disadvantaged areas. So it's really hard for professionals to hear that they've been part of this amazing success story, but it's still not good enough. And I think you know, that's what they're hearing. So, and I think, um, professionals find it very hard to work. I think that we, we don't know how to work effectively. We don't have the anecdotes and the stories about how we're going to move many of our, let's say, 15% most disadvantaged areas. How are we going to move them up, close that gap? Um, because we will need very different ways of working. Our schools need to operate slightly differently the way in which we support people. Health services need to be radically transformed as well. So how do we help professionals through this? Um, and where are our success stories? I think some Poverty Alliance Children in Scotland and other organisations, we need to be far better at helping, I think, and supporting the system to make these radical changes. Because there's no doubt we have to be really ambitious, dramatic and radical if we're going to make an impact. Tracy, are the lines of communication between academia and the third sector good enough? When you're producing this evidence, is it being picked up on acted upon? Can I sort of change your question a little bit and think, <laughs> think about... Um, well, Briefly, yes. <laughs> I don't mind. But I'd like to come back um, to it. I'm interested in how, as academics, we get our messages out in terms of the media. Yeah. And we've talked about, you know, we can write stories and there are all sorts of issues about how we might find the time to do this. But, you know, if we really want to, to get messages out there... But I think... You know, if we think about the Centre for Social Justice, they don't seem to have any problem in getting their stories mm. out. You know, they, they feature on all the kind. You know, they feature on Newsnight or whatever. So I think the, you know, there are some important questions of, you know, perhaps be interested to hear some reflections on, you know, the role that the media has in in choosing which bits of research get that sort of publicity and why it is that particular sorts of things might get lots of publicity and other pieces of research that, that might be um, better pieces of research don't. Stephen, <laughs> are, you, are, you, are there specific examples you're, you're, you're meaning you're things like the Centre for Social Justice? Well, I suppose I just think, you know, we, we, we think we've got a really good piece of research here. We mm -hmm. did it for Joseph Rowntree Foundation and we didn't get featured mm -hmm. on Newsnight or whatever, you know, but mm -hmm. you kind of, you see the sorts of reports that come out from Centre for Social Justice that get wheeled out and, and talked about on breakfast TV or whatever, BBC News. Yeah, um, the, the Centre for Social Justice is, is probably a bit of a a sore point, I don't know, I, I guess because of the uh, b because of its sort of history and because of the, the, the politics of it, it probably gets more attention than, than a lot of the work it does deserves, but it's kind of a name once the name gets known by news desks it becomes mm -hmm. somewhere they're happier to, to kind of feature again, but I, I, my perception is that the Joseph Roundtree Trust has, has similar kind of uh, acknowledgement, you know, wide recognition mm -hmm. so it should be able to, I, I think what I'm suggesting is there really needs to be almost a concerted myth-busting campaign uh, and uh, the, the kind of repetition I'm talking about, I was just jotting things down there, you know, the, the initial research needs to be promoted with, uh, as, uh, as uh, someone was suggesting, a well-written press release which will get you, uh, as Mark was saying, you know, that, that's what works, is if it's, if it's well-written and it's sent to the right people, it, it's got a fair chance of appearing. I don't think particular places are, are kind of ruled out, do you know what I mean, Be because they're um, as a source, if it's a strong story, it'll get in the paper. So your original research, uh, then perhaps um, following, following it up with case studies of, of families where intergenerational worklessness is, isn't the normal, perhaps even where intergenerational kind of volunteering and community engagement is the norm, and, and kind of try that story, but, uh, try and sell that story, but with, again with an expert saying, we know intergenerational workness this is a myth. It's kind of coming back to your original story. Uh, there are opportunities for increasing opportunities for opinion pieces in the papers. The Herald has an agenda, a daily agenda slot, which gives people an open 
an open mic sort of thing, someone should write about that on this exact theme, you know, why, why research is showing that this is a myth. Um, whether if there's further research replicating the findings, get that out there with an expert saying intergenerational worklessness is, is a myth uh, and, and it's already been proven. You know, if there are government statistical bulletins which demonstrate the same thing, then highlight it, get a press release out. You know, I think it needs to be that kind of really focusing on just that one thing and hammering it and hammering it. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, Jackie, you want to come back in briefly, if you would? I just wanted to sort of back up, Stephen, because... Um, I think, Pov I think Peter of Poverty Alliance and Children in Scotland and, and others would say actually, um, provided the story's right and everything and opinion pieces, using all those tools that Stephen said, we get a pretty good hearing. But I think the challenge back to us is that there is no doubt that we collectively are pretty good at highlighting problems and, and, and analysing the issues, etc. What we're not particularly good at is saying and therefore, here's what we're going to do. Now, can I, I, I tested this with my table, and they didn't, they didn't throw me out the window. So if I could just say to you, David Cameron, at the, at the Tory annual conference a couple of weeks ago, stood up and said, it is unacceptable for young people to leave school and go on to benefits. We wouldn't accept that for our children. So we will not accept that for any child. Now, that's quite powerful. His solution, he then went on to his solution, which was, therefore, we won't give them any benefits. That's fine. But what we do is we come out with these statements that this is unacceptable, that's unacceptable. That often, as a sector, we don't look at any practical solutions. That's, I know, a huge, probably an exaggeration. But do you not think collectively in terms of making the best use of a pretty benign, by and large, media presence, and I think we should think about social media as well, pretty benign in Scotland, are we really making the most of it in terms of what our agenda for action is? It's an interesting point, because it also strikes me that, I don't know if you'd agree with, with this, uh, Jackie, but I mean, it seems to me that one of the advantages of being a small country with a devolved politics is that if you have something serious to say from any side of the debate, almost, yes there is more of a chance of getting it heard, at least initially, yeah? I, I certainly think yeah. that from our perspective. Again, you know, I, I did see Peter, I think, nodding, if I can say. You know, maybe others disagree, but I absolutely yeah. think that's right, Keith. There's been a hand up at the back of the room, and I'm sorry I kept you waiting. It's Susan, is it? Yeah. I, I, I think you're right regarding the media, eh? And it isn't just, I can't say that I've ever wrote a press release, because I've never wrote a press release. But the difference with the media of the day than what was maybe 10 years ago is Twitter. Twitter and Facebook and things like that, right? Because I could be on there and read, read off the internet the column that David Cameron has just written and totally, within one tweet, regurgitate what it should actually say. And I could be going to events for a talk about the bedroom tax or something like that where I've never contacted the press, but the press turn up at the events because they can that I'm gone because I've said on Twitter, I'm gone here or I'm gone there or I'm gone there or this isn't right or that's not right. So the media is changing, but only for the perception that we've used social media for to turn the media on its head sure. and turn the journalists towards what we are talking about because the new company adds for their stories because they kind of get them. Thanks. It's an interesting book. Can I just ask the room? I mean, how many people professionally use things like Twitter and Facebook? I don't mean socially, but professionally use it. It's, it's a bit over half, but it's not hugely over half. <laughs> How effective do you find it? Anybody? Do you agree with Susan? It's a good way to get your message out, at least over the initial hurdles. Yeah? Anybody? I think it's better in terms of keeping in touch with certain. Yeah, what, 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 with each other or with information or what? It, because of the people I follow, I don't, I don't miss anything that's happening in relation to welfare reform or employability because I'm, you know, I, I can guarantee that one of the hundred or so folk that I follow on those particular subjects is going to tweet about any report that comes out that is going to be of vague interest. Yeah. I mean, Sunday morning, someone was tweeting to me suggesting I read the book that Tracy and, and Rob had written. He said it was that was Tracy and Rob. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he said it was a fantastic read, but one of the most depressing things he'd ever, he'd ever read. So take from that, take from that what you will. Okay, thanks. Anybody else want to come in on, on the use of social media? Somebody who doesn't use them, why not? Is it just because you're like me, you're too old-fashioned, or are there other reasons? Do people have reservations about them? Yeah. Sorry, can you hang on for the mic? There we go. 
I don't use it because I haven't got access to it on my phone. Mm. Right. But, I mean, to me, I mean, I don't trust newspapers, I don't trust tellies, I don't trust anything. The only people I trust is coming to meetings like this and hearing the truth from professionals and people experiencing it themselves. Yeah, but presumably you accept there's a need to get... Me I mean, this is, this is a room full of the committed isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's a self-selecting room. It's people who are here because they want to be here. You need to get beyond that, don't you? Yeah, but I was saying, like, you're on about people won't give the stories. I gave my story, and I had such a bad knockback off it. I could never do it again. It's the way that the journalists treat the people. That's why they can't get the stories anymore. So, really, it's your own fault. <laughs> no offence to you personally. Like. <laughs> OK, I'll take one more if there is one, and then we'll go once around the panel and just get some closing thoughts from them. Yeah, right in the middle there. I'm just like to see there's far too many leaflets actually with Mark actually. Uh, I, do, I do do a lot of, used to do a lot of writing uh, to newspapers, letters to the editor and all that sort of thing in magazines. I've had quite a few printed. If they were too near the bone I actually wouldn't print them, I'd re-edit them. But I wrote to NHS, the medical newspaper, when I got involved with the Poverty Lines five and a half years ago, I've made every effort to actually educate myself as much as possible. And living in Ayrshire, where there's a major drug problem, um, I wrote to NHS medical free freebie that's out on all the doctor's surgeries and all the rest. I've written to them two or three times and sent them stuff, and they've yet to answer me. Um, they never mentioned drugs or alcohol on the NHS thing. I think there's far too many leaflets. I think it is, and Stephen said it's connecting with people. I, if I had more energy. I actually come off Facebook, I was a Facebook activist, I was with Avatorg, Change.org, 38 Degrees and everything else, and I'm absolutely gobsmacked the signatures they can get within days. Really? Uh, Greenpeace, mm -hmm. the last year's theory, I think it was 200,000. You know, it's just within minutes, within days, it's away. It's, I've been global, Australia, Puerto Rico, and over, over the world, and I've actually come off because I'm exhausted. But um, to get connect with people, you know, deprived areas, problem families, like I said before, adventure playgrounds, um, People like myself actually are no working, going in and being mothers, or befriending people and the rest to it. Um, I was going to say there, I forget what I was going to actually say, it sounds really, really important. <laughs> and it's slipped, no, it's slipped. Tweet it to it's, us later. <laughs> no, it's just, it's, it's the connect, it's the connect, it's yeah. the health houses. You know, what, what I live in here just now, if I'd say six move, but I'm in here. White City is the centre of here, it's a jungle. There's empty flats. And, the, you know, what I said, actually, I walk through it, I sing, I, I, I send up blessings for the folk, I talk to folk. The women haven't even got washing lines. You go through White City and there's no washing lines. The washing areas are all closed up and folk have got their washing hanging out the windows. And I think it's disgusting. I wouldn't like to be a mother living in a flat, actually, without any washing line. You know, there's empty properties and I speak to people and there's self-harm and there's sexual abuse. I, I'm, I'm amongst people all the time. Nothing would shock me. Now, what's the, 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 the thing we're having? Signposted places. Now, give me a flat. Give me a flat in White City with a three-piece suite, a kettle, and a few, a few cups and a toaster. And let folk come in and have a fag. The place is open, actually. Let people come in, actually, and tell you the problems. And then you signpost them out to places. There's far too many chiefs and no enough Indians, and things is not getting done. I've seen it, actually. People are running ragged. You're in a dole, or you've got an addiction, or something wrong with you. You're sent all the tune. A boy with an, an amputee, he amputated a leg, and it wasn't through drugs, he stood in a nail and he lost his leg. You have to walk miles between you to go to the same to this place, and then to that place, and the next place. Folk are spinning in circles. In the deep, in those areas, actually, it wouldn't be hard to have a property. It doesn't need to be all leaflets and all proper and professional. Put a fault of myself in it. People that have been mothers and all the rest and lived a real life actually and worked. I've worked all my life, I worked for a 10 year old. So it gives a three piece suite and some kettles and stuff. Gives the information, instead of all these damn leaflets, one directory, one simple directory of every service available. All that money, ad action okay. spending, all the money, everything spending, spend it in one directory and flats. So folk can come right. and be Let's safe. Let's get some it's responses. It's so that. simple. Let's You're get asking for it. Thank you very much. It's so simple. Thanks for that. Just to finish this up, just picking up on that point and the points that were made before it, we've had a room full of people today, people not without influence and not without some authority and power in their own field, who have come to a broad consensus about the nature of this problem, about the fact that it is not 
caused by the things that are conventionally said to be causing it. The conventional explanations are wrong. The problems are different from those we're, some, we're sometimes asked to believe are, are the roots of them. What needs to happen next? What needs to happen next? Let's just take a sentence from each of you on that. Tracy, would you kick us off? Uh, well, I suppose one practical thing that we can all take away is to um, challenge myths when we, when we hear them and to use evidence and be prepared to, to use the different forums that, that we might have to do that, but be prepared to speak up and, and, and say things and to challenge people when, when they say things that we know are incorrect. Stephen. Um, I think my main message is I think attitudes can be changed. I just think it's very difficult. And I think the... the, the, the Central ones here are very, very ingrained, um, but challenging myths is absolutely right. And uh, in the ways I'm talking about, in terms of trying to produce editorial, trying to get journalists to write about your issues, but also just challenging them, challenging them in the letters page. And 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 the ref I've not talked about social media, but most journalists are on Twitter. It's made us much more accessible. You can actually read an article and and uh, tweet. Uh, the journalists, it's easier than finding their phone number or even their email address and say, you've got it wrong, you know, and here's what you should look at. And, here, and I think it's possible, it, I, I've, I've seen it on other issues, that, that things that seem quite ingrained as attitudes in uh, senior levels, in, in newspapers and in, in the kind of editorial mindset, if you like, can be changed, but it takes time. Jackie Brock. Um, Sharon put it brilliantly when she showed us her graph People all of a sudden in the 80s didn't become lazy and feckless and shirkers. Yeah. When there were jobs, people were working. So we have to know each area of our country, but let's just say, you know, each of our most disadvantaged areas, what is the plan for their jobs? And then all of you, but crucially the local communities there, can, we can work together to secure if you like, the sort of long-term future, knowing what the jobs plan is, what are the schools doing, how are we making sure that, for example, schools are bringing in parents to support parents who haven't worked to develop skills, but becoming good parents is a skill, and um, so many of our primary schools are working with parents on basic things. How to play snakes and ladders involves sharing, invel involves taking turns. Some of these parents and some of the children don't understand that. So these sorts of skills, by, by supporting improved parenting, we can support looking at eventually skills for life. It's, sorry, it's a bit, getting a bit convoluted, but we're not using enough, we don't have a long-term plan about how we can make sure that the population can get back into work in these areas. So we need the stories about how each section, each resource within the community, schools, the youth clubs, the, the CABs, the centers, the, the housing that you were talking about earlier, what are we really doing to make sure that we have a clear focus that people are going to get, be able to get back into work over the long term? And I'm sure we can do it. And where are our stories about how we're doing it and how, um, what our plan is for achieving that? Tracy Sheldrick, Stephen Naismith, Jackie Brock, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. <laughs> We've heard a lot today about the, the Daily Mail um, Here's another, here's another Daily Mail quote for you. Uh, the uh, man who founded the Daily Mail was a man called Nor Lord Northcliffe. And somebody once said to him, what's your definition of a journalist? And he said, well, the function of a journalist is to explain patiently to others what he personally doesn't understand. Um, now, I think it's with that sort of mission in mind that I was asked just to say a few words to try and sum up the day. And I sat there while the table discussion was going on and made notes about all the things that had resonated with me as, as a friendly outsider, if you like, as an interested uh, newcomer to some of this discussion, the things that have resonated with me today uh, from each of the presentations. But in fact, just looking down my list, we've actually touched on nearly all of them in that last discussion. And that suggests to me a, a sense of consensus and a sense of purpose about today. I'm never surprised when I meet the third sector by the enthusiasm, but I'm often I, I, I do tend to be surprised by consensus, because I don't think the sector is much given to that. I've sensed today that there is a real agreement, that there is an agenda that needs changing out there, and there's been some beginnings of agreement about some ways to go about it. I think it's been an enormously thoughtful day, ac across the day. Um, I've been surprised how often I've been surprised 
Um, nothing scares journalists more than, than, than hearing stuff they didn't know already, because we think we know just about everything. Um, I've heard a lot today that was new to me, and that's, that's been healthy, that's been an astonishing thing. Let's now try to think of ways to get those things out there, get that evidence out there. These are very familiar topics, they're in the papers every day, they're on the television and the radio every day, but the evidence that's been around today isn't familiar, and that's the gap that needs to be bridged. I think a lot of what Stephen was saying about hitting anecdote back with anecdote is a very powerful way to think about going forward. And that's not a horrible phrase, but it's not rocket science. I think it's been very effectively done in relation to the bedroom tax. Because the instinct of, 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 of the voluntary sector, when hit with something they disapprove of, is to come back at it with a flurry of statistics uh, and a flurry of information. What's worked with the bedroom tax is actually that for every story that's come out of government saying people are living and being subsidized to live in houses that are much too big for them, back has come a story which says, no, this is about somebody who's on dialysis and can't get the machine in the room. This is about somebody with a sleeping disorder. This is about a, a, a lonely widow who would like to see her kids at the weekend and be able to put them up. So it doesn't have to be a hard anecdote to get. If you can come back with those sorts of stories, humanize the stuff, then it gets the message across. So I think We've started to get a, bit, a sense of agreement and consensus and purpose in the room today around that sort of agenda. And I hope you think that that's been as valuable as I think it's been. So can I ask you just to join me in thanking the Poverty Alliance for putting on the event today. Thank two. Let me just get to the end of these and then we can record our thanks. Thanks to the Joseph Rowntree Foundation for their sponsorship. Thanks to all of our speakers and panelists and facilitators, all of whom have had interesting things to say. Thanks very much to the team who've looked after the sound and the pictures and the, the TV camera. Thanks to the staff here at City Halls for looking after us all day. But most of all, thanks to all of you for taking the time and the trouble to be here and to engage with these issues as enthusiastically as you have. I hope you found it inspiring. I hope you found it useful. I hope you found it enjoyable. Safe journey home. <laughs>